Professor James uh, Richardson, who is uh, a sociologist of flow, is, is it right? Um, of law, religion, and uh, human rights. And he will speak uh, about an update on minor minority religions and the context of violence and interactionist perspective for 30 minutes, please. From Reno. From Reno. Shall I go ahead? Yes. Yes, you're good. Okay, we'll give it a try. You can see my first slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I appreciate being invited to be a part of this conference and certainly wish I could be there. Yeah, it would be more exciting than sitting here in Reno, Nevada, but... Uh, so be it. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to at least present via Zoom. Uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, present an outline of my presentation. Uh, back in 2001, I published an article that I'll summarize in about the first five or six slides. Uh, I'll do that as quickly as I can. And then I want to talk about uh, extending uh, the effort to understand violence that affects new religions and involves them. I'll be particularly focusing on a wonderful uh, book that Stuart Wright and Susan Palmer have done that uh, some of you are, will be aware of. I'll be summarizing some of that work and drawing some conclusions uh, from it and other work that's been done. Uh, so we'll go to the second slide. Here's the article that I refer to. And if anybody really wants to ever read the original, I'd be happy to uh, send you an electronic copy of it. It's, uh, it was an effort to be fairly comprehensive. Uh, it has uh, 146 footnotes. I, I counted up uh, where I attempt to cite a lot of literature involved with uh, minority religions and violent episodes that have been, uh, that have developed uh, over, up, up until the time I published. It applies a conflict perspective, pointing out that NRMs are often perceived to be in basic conflict with the values and vested interests of the dominant culture. So uh, the fact that there might be occasional conflict and even violence uh, perhaps should not be too surprising. There's competition for members, for legitimacy, public acceptance, the source of funding, uh, rate fundraising, po political support, and altogether that makes for a significant potential that I call the context of violence. Uh, the article focuses on interactional aspects of violence instead of a very typical what I call a characterological approach used in the mass media and by others, uh, including government entities quite often, that assumes there's some kind of individual or group psychopathy at work and that it has nothing to do with the culture, conflict with the culture, or with actions of entities in the dominant culture. In, in this article, I included both instances of individual and what I call collective violence. So we'll talk about that some. Uh, I examined whether some NRMs through their actions and beliefs actually foster violence among members and towards others, either deliberately or inadvertently. I think Eileen may talk more about that if she can get her system up and running. Uh, I also examine the nature of violence of various kinds directed toward NREMs by outsiders, individuals, organizations, and governmental entities, uh, of which there was much to talk about, and that has increased mightily, as we'll be discussing later. Uh, this is a listing of the groups that I explicitly discussed uh, violent episodes concerning uh, in this particular article. 
And I also briefly commented on some historical examples uh, of violence toward new religions and brought on by religious groups uh, in the past. Um, a, there are some important considerations to note. Uh, at the risk of offending some, I would point out that America fosters a culture of violence. Uh, 170 uh, people get killed every uh, day in America with guns, if that's one example. Uh, but uh, I just assert that the vast majority of NRMs are peaceful and not violent, which in a way could be viewed as somewhat surprising given how much violence there is present in American culture at this time. I also note that violent tendencies can be exacerbated tremendously by the direct competition that develops for various resources, including particularly participants. Um, also, there's present in the media treatments of new religious movements, a based on a, a few quite violent examples that violence is inevitable just because of the nature of the group. Uh, that's regrettable, but uh, the mass media coverage of some episodes like Jonestown and Solar Temple and um, the Waco episode, uh, all of that has uh, convinced a lot of people in the American public and elsewhere that violence is inevitable when you're talking about new religious groups. That is not true empirically, but that is a perception. I also talk about the fact that uh, direct attacks by the anti-cult movement and by governmental leaders and agencies has contributed greatly because they can provoke reactions from new religious movements that become violent. That's demonstrated in a number of the groups that I discussed uh, in, in the ar original article. The original article talks about atrocity tales as being weapons used against new religious movements. These are events that are perceived to be fragrant violation of cultural norms that contributes to moral outrage, moral panics, and these are used to authorize sanctions and mobilize against the new religions by individuals, organizations, and even governments. These uh, atrocity tales can be of many types, personal freedom losses, like uh, from alleged brainwashing, um, loss of property, uh, conventional patterns of behavior, like uh, that break up family supposedly, and then strange practices or un unacceptable practices in the dominant culture spanking of children, homeschooling, unconditional sexual mores developed, trickery and fundraising that's alleged, and just poor living conditions are sometimes used to attack uh, new religious movements, among other things. And I, I make a point that veracity of the claim is not an issue. If the claim is made in the mass media and promoted, then it can be used to justify targeting a group and justify social control efforts. But one particular form of violence against new religions that uh, involved, uh, it was involved particularly for a couple of decades in America and is still used elsewhere is deprogramming. There were thousands of kidnappings in America and incarceration of new religious movement participants over the years it actually became a, a, what should be described as an industry that involved uh, anti-cult movement organizations referring parents who wanted to get their children out of a group to deprogrammers and deprogrammers keeping very busy doing all sorts of uh, deprogrammings. Uh, this spread around the world and is still going on in some uh, uh, societies, particularly in the Far East, uh, but uh, it, it died out eventually uh, in America because of uh, some court cases that developed uh, and some negative publicity that accrued from what was happening. There's a term exit counseling that now involves 
what's being done. It usually involves uh, trying to talk people out of new religions. And sometimes those conversations have even been sanctioned by the courts. And they've certainly been promoted by ACM organizations. But I spend quite a bit of time in this article on organizational level violence against new religious movements, uh, governmental actions of various kinds, uh, raids, and then legislation being passed to try to control them. Self-help efforts were quite often used, including uh, private deprogrammers uh, taking action. The mass media has played a very important role in uh, making this seem normal and necessary. Uh, the attacks include all kinds of things, limiting fundraising, affecting the tax exempt status, limiting housing opportunities through zoning regulation changes and assisting governmental uh, agencies developing reports about the so-called cult menace and even using uh, the courts to try to suppress new religious movements by filing lawsuits against them of various kinds, some of which were successful, uh, many of which were then overturned on appeal, but it was a, a very important tactic that was used. There were also a number of tactics, a number of raids by governmental agencies around the world. We'll talk about those later with reference to Stuart and Palmer's book. And all these efforts together have led to what I call deformation of many new religious movements as they've had to reallocate resources to defend themselves. And uh, a number of movements have even been totally uh, uh, stopped or obliterated by these efforts. Now for an update and an extension. It's worth noting that moral panics about NRMs have subsided somewhat in, in some parts of the world. But interestingly enough, governmental interventions, especially those involving dynamic entry raids, have increased. Uh, that's a kind of a counterintuitive development. The moral panic about NRMs has subsided somewhat, I think, because of the tremendous interest in uh, terrorism that's uh, superseded concern about new religious movements in a number of Western societies. But it's also worth noting that in some societies, particularly Russia and China, we've seen new definitions develop where minority religions in general and new religious movements are defined somehow as terrorist organizations, justifying tremendous efforts to exert control over them. There's been all kinds of new scholarship that has developed uh, expanding our knowledge base. I'm going to talk a lot about the new book that I've already mentioned uh, that Stuart and Susan did. But there are other things worth mentioning. Uh, Massimo's Cessner Journal has become a very important outlet uh, developing uh, stories about violence involving new religious movements around the world, particularly China, Russia, Taiwan, South Korea, but also Europe. And Willie Fotra's online Human Rights Without Frontiers has become an important source of some such information, particularly about Europe, but also China and Russia. And he's done some a series of uh, articles or, or columns about uh, deprogramming in Japan that some of you may be aware of, where it's still going on to some extent. I'd also mention work by Jonathan Fox, Roger Finke, and his students that have demonstrated an increase in legislative kind of efforts at social control in Western democracies that have led to more efforts uh, at social control and helped justify more state-level interventions. And then, uh, as many of you might be aware, the U.S. State Department has developed an important uh, annual report now starting in the early 90s. They've been doing this for decades now, talking about uh, categorizing countries around the world. 
uh, for levels of religious discrimination. So there's lots of new research, in other words. Now I want to talk more about Stuart Wright and Susan Palmer's book called Storming Zion. If you haven't uh, seen this book or read it, I strongly recommend it. Uh, it's a very systematic gathering of data. They've gathered data on 116 raids in the past 50 or 60 years by governmental entities in 17 Western-oriented countries. They've demonstrated that the frequency has dramatically increased in the 90s, falling off slightly in after 2000. But it's worth noting that 77% of those 116 raids have occurred since 1990. However, they readily admit two things. One, they don't address raids in other parts of the world. And uh, their, their 116 total is not a complete total. They uh, have found they're finding new ones all the time. And since Stuart is there, he might be able to comment in the discussion period about any new raids that they've be, become aware of. Uh, by the way, we're, we're talking here about raids that fit the, typically fit the notion of a dynamic entry where lots of law enforcement and media and governmental entities show up in a surprise kind of raid against a religious group. So it's not just a couple of people dropping by to check on things. It's something much more uh, concerning than that. They give a, uh, a good historical and theoretical analysis of why this has happened in the book. And then they have separate chapters on all of the groups listed there in, uh, in their book. And they have even a separate chapter on France, which uh, Susan's done another book on and whatnot. France has a 57 of the 116 raids have occurred in France. That, that required a separate chapter, and maybe we'll provoke some discussion uh, in this conference after I finish, or because your conference is taking place in France. Why so many raids in France is a good question, which uh, Stuart and Susan try to respond to in their chapter on France. They apply a social movement theoretical perspective, giving major credit to any cult movement efforts to mobilize opposition internationally. Uh, they present a kind of a three-part scheme, strategic framing, where efforts are made to redefine the groups as significant threats using kind of the atrocity tales thing I talked about, focusing on major examples of violence involving new religions, and also depending heavily on uh, reports by apostates and survivors. Uh, I put those words in quotes because they have, have a special meaning, as I'm sure most of you will be aware. They also talk about the anti-cult movement's attribution of opportunities and threats, uh, taking advantage of political opportunities to uh, get attention in the media and from uh, institutional elites about the cult menace, uh, and try to encourage them to do something about it. The last one is social ap appropriation, where some uh, anti-cult movement actors and organizations have been able to mobilize pre-existing organizations and uh, social networks, including governmental agencies. They've built alliances to promote uh, efforts to oppose and debilitate new religious movements. These tactics were particularly effective in the late 80s and 90s, where what John uh, Laughlin calls the white hot mobilization phase occurred, especially in France, where its history, culture, institutional and political structure were primed to exert considerable control over minority faiths. And I don't have to go into a lot of detail about that with this audience, I don't think. It's worth noting that uh, they discuss a new frame uh, to develop that was developed to use and control of uh, new religions, the Kelly Plan. I've written about that particularly with reference to what took place in Australia, where there was a dramatic shift 
from the brainwashing based approach, which uh, lost some credence due to some very important uh, judicial decisions made in America and uh, in other places, including uh, France. Uh, the, the shift occurred uh, according to a plan that a guy named, a deep program named Galen Kelly developed, where the focus was on child abuse of various kinds. Uh, many of these groups became vulnerable because they had many children. Some of them, such as the Family International, didn't believe in birth control, so it wasn't too long before the number of children outnumbered the number of adults in that particular group. Also, uh, they talk about collective child abuse, something that was obvious in raids in a, a, against a group in Texas that Stuart and I have written about, where just being a member of a group uh, or a group that had children, uh, accusations could be raised about some kind of child abuse, and that could justify, according to some, uh, these dynamic entry raids against some new religious movement. They focus on uh, four particular areas in their concluding chapter, which I would certainly recommend to all of you. They talk about the fact of human rights and civil liberties violations against new religious movements, typically using the justification that new religious movements aren't real religions, so no one is concerned about their rights are about the veracity of claims against them. And in this particular section, they also go into some detail about all the child abuse accusations that have occurred within the Catholic Church, yet they have led to very little efforts at social control. There have been a few in recent years, but very few efforts, and certainly no dynamic entry kinds of raids. <laughs> that we've seen against certain, some new religious movements. They also discuss something called child-sponsored child abuse. Hundreds, maybe, I, I think even thousands of children have been removed from parents in these raids that are described in their book, and some of which were described in my earlier article. Uh, these raids took the children away. They were treated very poorly. Uh, placed in foster homes or placed in very crowded conditions with poor food and, and uh, just generally not good places to have children. They call this state-sponsored child abuse. It's worth noting that virtually all of the children were eventually returned to the groups because charges were not brought against uh, the groups. They couldn't find evidence. And in the episode in Australia, damages were actually paid to the family, had to be paid by one of the governments that uh, took, that did the raiding. And also, of course, in the tragic Waipo episode, a number of children were actually burned to death in the final conclusion of that group. They talk about the debilitation and destruction of religious communities. Many of these groups deformed by their attacks against them. And they've all had to reallocate resources to defend themselves and regain control of their children. And then there's a discussion of the excessive militarization of police forces in America, particularly where uh, uh, they claim and I think rightfully so that this has contributed greatly to the propensity to have such raids with the kind of a idea that we have the equipment and the manpower, so why not use it? And what they call a war model is developed for dealing with terrorism and drug cartels. And it's now used, has been used against religious groups as well. So with that, I'll uh, conclude by pointing out that I think the early, the theoretical development and the, that I presented in 2001 in that earlier publication is still applicable and perhaps even more so because of what's happened with the increase in governmental interventions and raids. These new, the new research that I've discussed 
uh, reveals uh, these very effective tactics being used by the opponents of new religions uh, to promote more state level interventions. Uh, obviously more research is needed to be done to include other areas of the world. Uh, what's happening in Russia right now and in China needs to be examined, but also other societies where new religious movements are being persecuted. And we need to update uh, Wright and Palmer's work on Western democracies, increase the database, and see what's, hap what's happened since uh, they uh, stopped gathering data for their book, uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, eight or ten years ago. Uh, so my concluding statement would be that the internationalist perspective that I developed and presented and that others have made use of predicts more state level interventions. And those may in turn may yield more strong reactions from some groups that have enough resources to survive such state level efforts to suppress them. So with that, I will close and uh, do whatever Bernadette wants me to do. So I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs>
and he explained, uh, you know, the different factions fighting within the country. You know, in fact, there were supposed to be two, but maybe three or maybe other groups between the extreme Republicans, anti-clerical anti groups, uh, and among the Catholics, the very extremist um, Catholics, those who were far more liberal, et cetera, et cetera. And I wonder if that's not just the heritage of that where, that we keep seeing uh, against, uh, you know, um, minority groups. Uh, they won't really attack the Catholic Church anymore because anyway, its power has diminished dramatically. But you see it exerted against, you know, some forms of Islam, not all of it. And in particular, you know, you can call that scapegoating minority groups because they're easy to target. Nobody really cares about them in society. So you can attack them without having a major sort of political backlash. So I think it's a sort of continuation of a very fragmented society over the centuries. I mean, it's not anything new. So that might be why we are champions at having, you know, these kind of raids. I must say, though, that they are not as bad as those in Russia or China. I mean, we don't usually, you know, open people up and take their organs and things like that. OK, but. Uh, I, I agree uh, with virtually everything you said, I would make a couple of quick points. I think it's ironic in a way, given what you said, that the Catholic Church in France has played a role in developing the efforts in France to control new religions. It uh, seems like almost a classic case of uh, a dominant religion not wanting any competition. So they have played a role, and, and Stuart and Palmer's book discussed that uh, at some length. I also, uh, with some regret, I would mention that uh, a lot of the groups that are viewed as problematic in France uh, originated in America, and I think there's a bit of anti-American sentiment involved in what has happened as well. So there, there are many possible avenues to pursue, but I thought I would mention those two, uh, but also agree with what you said. Oh, I agree too with what you're saying. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But they are so tiny that, in fact, most people in France do not know about what goes on with those groups. And, uh, it, it, and if they know about them, they are gener people are generally suspicious of those groups. So if they are raided or if they are monitored very uh, tightly, people won't care. They will think that maybe those groups can be dangerous. So it's fine if they are monitored. Yeah. Yes. Jim Stewart, uh, thank you for promoting our book. Um, I, get a, I get a cut of the royalties. Okay. You know, uh, our original thinking on this was to focus on Western style democracies because they have these constitutional guarantees of religious liberty. Yeah. So we were thinking that, that the, uh, the paradox of, of, of seeing these militarized raids in places where religious freedom was guaranteed uh, was was making a, a point that we wanted to to make uh, strongly. Now, obviously, um, we didn't have the means to go into Russia and China. I'd love to do that book if anybody has uh, the resources. Um, and I will say this: uh, I'm working on a paper right now where I'm updating the data. We've kept this database alive, and we now have uh, 173 documented raids. And wow. Uh, after, after really um, 2000, about the mid-2000s, uh, the raids in France declined uh, dramatically. In fact, uh, I couldn't document a single raid after 2010 in France. Um, and I'm, I think it's because of the, the, the refocusing on Islamic terrorists. You, you see so many incidents that occurred in France from uh, Islamic extremists and jihadists, and I think they redirected their resources. That's my, that's my theory. I'm sticking with it. So, yeah, <laughs> I think it's a good theory. It's not a theory. I think it's uh, you know looking at facts. Yeah. Well, there's also something about the relationship between the media and the anti-cult movement and the government in France that 
for example, in many of these raids, you'd have, you know, TV crews, um, and you'd have uh, you'd have um, journalists like Nicola, what's his name, who is actively, you know, getting well networking with anti cult movement and the government. So the government wants to to be seen as doing something. It's like what what Jim and Stuart said in their other book about crime control theater, that phrase, you know. And the other thing that's weird is that Nivalut has a special squad, a kind of SWAT team that's trained to crack down on cults. And they're very scary and they come in and jump on people. You know, they call called Kaimades. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. It's an acronym. Uh, yeah, it's the Shalom Kaimades. Oh, yeah. It's not the no, 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 it's the government. It's the police as a special anti yeah, yeah. yeah, But they're it's trained. The same in Italy, but in Italy it's very But more. they're trained by Mivili. They are trained they by Mivili, work, Mivili, yeah, but workshops. they depend from the police. Yeah, from okay. The but that's... The police is not the gendarmerie. It's the two police. But the, also a lot of the raids, especially on Scientology, were um, from Le Fisc, you know. And well, what, a, the what other country does that, like? Launches a race. Tax rates. Well, and other groups too, but we have tax rates. Yeah, but the tax rates added up in all the groups, you know, and I find that kind of weird. Like, that's the way they handle people. Who, oh, well, this is what we explained yesterday, what somebody called the Al Capone. Uh, yeah. uh, what do you yeah. uh, can I? Let, let me add just one more thing. I'll hand it over to Massimo. Um, one of the things that, uh, that we theorize was that um, in France, the anti-cult organizations were basically integrated into the government um, and became an arm of the state, as opposed to say in the United States, they became they were they remained third party groups that had to lobby from the outside to try to influence politicians and elected officials. Whereas uh, in France, uh, it looked like to me that that Mivalut and and uh, these various anti cult organizations were a part of the state. Yeah, I have a comment when I ask a question to Jim. The comment is uh, I, I did the speech at, uh, it was the keynote speech at the ASR, and uh, uh, the, my point is there are basically three models the French model, where the anti cult is part of the government. The American model, where it's basically a private organization with heavy connection with the media, and the Russian and Chinese model, where it's not part of the government, it's really part of public security or the police. So it's uh, it's slightly different. But uh, another difference uh, uh, between different countries, and here is what I want to ask to Jim, is in the case of France, for example, above France, there is the European Court of Human Rights. So they didn't only lose the tax case against the Jehovah's Witnesses, even with uh, an admittedly strange group like the Mandarom. The Mandarom went to the European Court of Human Rights with a terrible decision against France, calling it a non-democratic country. So uh, above France, there is the European Court. The problem is uh, uh, Russia just walked out of the European Court and the, uh, the China and Russia are not part uh, so even uh, Russia now not part of court, China is not of a European court. But what I wanted to ask you when we discussed this in another conference is what other avenues are open in uh, like the uh, uh, Human Rights Committee of the United Nations, which has certain power to rule uh, of uh, the uh, violation of international covenant of civil and political rights, uh, 
So what can somebody do if uh, a cult believes it cannot uh, have uh, justice in its own country, besides the European Court, which is not uh, uh, accessible from anybody or, or from all countries? Well, uh, I don't know how long we have here, but uh, that's an interesting question. What venue, what venues are available to new religious movements who think they are being attacked or that, and in fact, are being attacked? Um, there is some, one thing that's worth, hap- worth mentioning is that some of the groups have had some success educating people in the media and if you can get the media turned around uh, in a society, that's very important uh, because of the role they played, frankly, in the persecution of the religious movement. But uh, your question is, I think, more about formal uh, judicial or in some way avenues that might be available to groups to defend themselves. It is true, as you pointed out uh, in the conference recently in Padova and, and just now, that uh, the United Nations has committees that are being used or attempting to be used by some of the groups, including the witnesses. They've run uh, a recent uh, ruling or opinion. It's not, they're not a court, but they're, they're, they have opined and urged some of the former Soviet countries to uh, stop persecuting the witnesses as they're doing following Russia's lead. There's also uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union that is starting to be used uh, by religious groups, including the witnesses, uh, to defend themselves. Uh, That court, as you heard me say in Padova, has issued a number of rulings since 2017 uh, about my, uh, minor in cases brought by minority religions, uh, the European Court of Human Rights started its uh, dealing with minority religions claims in 1993 with the Kokonakis case, and have done so ever since. Although recently, they are backing away and granting more uh, leeway to nations. Uh, in their governance of their religious scene using concepts like the margin of appreciation, what will happen with the Court of Justice of the European Union remains to be seen, but they seem to be trying to exert themselves. And some scholars, John Witt, for instance, has indicated in an article that they may be the new forum for religious freedom cases in Europe. So there, there are uh, lots of avenues that can be brought. All of it takes time, of course. When you're talking about going to court, you better be ready for the long haul because these cases do take time. Although it's worth noting in closing that the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union has figured out a procedure that uh, vastly lowers the amount of time a religious group might need to uh, receive a judgment from that court compared to the European Court of Human Rights where cases sometimes dragged on for 10 years or so. With that, I'll stop talking about that, but you've opened up a a wonderful avenue that I hope others will consider pursuing, and that is what can new religious movements do to fight this uh, effort to control them using governmental entities and, and other methods? 